don't have as many verses, but oh my goodness, do we have some discussion to have today. So I hope that as we look today at these words, that one, <clears throat> let's be thoughtful about what we're saying, because there's some real, whew, there's some tough things in here. And uh, I'm going to need your help in terms of how to discern what it is that God's trying to say in this. So we're going to start by reading uh, Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. Okay, 1 through 15. So somebody want to read that first 15 verses? I would appreciate that. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so uh, that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how do you owe my man, or how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told them, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For people <coughs> of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, the worldly wealth, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into an eternal dwelling. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonored with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this <laughs> and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourself in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. All right. Thank you, John. Okay, this is one of those things where you kind of go, um, this doesn't sound right. Did anybody else feel that way? Okay, I see those hands. Okay, yeah, this is strange. This, how in the world? Wow. Well, first off, let's take a, a step back and say, who is he, who is Jesus trying to talk to about this story? Okay, who, who is Jesus, the people he's communicating with? Who is it he's pointing this message to? His disciples. His disciples. Okay. And uh, the Pharisees were in on this too, and of course, you know, <laughs> take the opposing and questionable view. Yes, 
Yeah. And um, so we've got the disciples, we've got the Pharisees who are hearing this. Um, and remember, we've been talking about parables. Last time, we had the parable of the prodigal son who went and did all this stuff with his dad's money and he had no friends at the end, even though he spent it all. Um, and now we're seeing something very different. We see this first line or first verse, it says, the manager was wasting his employer's money. At least that's how my translation is. Meaning he's not being efficient in the use of it, okay? He isn't stealing it, but he's wasting it. He's not buying the right thing. It's kind of like when you think, you, you think, wow, if I do this, it'll save me money. And in the long run, you find it didn't actually save you money. It's actually the opposite of that. Because you had to do, remember back in the 70s when there was supposedly these different basement treatments to get all the water out of your basement or mold and actually it caused more problems than not? I'm not asking to show hands who did those kind of things. But that's just, oh, that's heartache. And, and sometimes when we see certain things happen, um, all of a sudden other things happen. And you sometimes think, well, why did I waste my money? So let's talk about this now. So we have this manager whose God is, Jesus is telling us, he's telling us a parable. And remember, one of the main things a parable is doing is trying to make a main point, okay? So let's make sure we remember, let's find out what the main point is here. And then we'll go from there. But don't lose sight of that main point. I see probably the big point is in verse 9. It says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Huh. So we're called to use the resources we have to influence our world. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Is if, if all you're doing is living it for yourself and that all the resources all about me, myself, and I, there's a problem there. There's a major problem. And Jesus is saying we should use our resources to benefit others and also making friends with them. Because that's what it's for. So a, a great celebration is a birthday, isn't it? And isn't it interesting that when you usually have a birthday, especially for us at our age, uh, when we have birthday parties, guess who's usually spending all the money? We are, right? We're the ones celebrating our birthdays and having other people. There was a gentleman I knew who was having a birthday party, and he had the whole church, after church, do a big celebration, and he paid for the whole thing. Guess what? He had a good-sized birthday party because it was a great meal. There was something to be said about that. Why is it that we have meals and other things like that when it comes to graduations and all? Because we want people to come. And if we have food, it seems like people come because we all need food each and every day. We just don't need as much as we sometimes would like. And well, that's a whole other thing. So let's go look here at this issue again. So the main issue is use our resources to benefit others and make friends. However, we, what we see him thinking doesn't quite line up to that story, I think. But we see that he is saying to himself, I'm going to get fired, and I want other people to like me and hopefully hire me. So I'm going to put this guy's wealth in a way that I reduce other people's payment to this gentleman so that when I get canned, maybe one of those people will like me or help me get on their payroll, right? Am I, I'm not saying anything that it isn't saying in here, right? That's what he's thinking. Now, to you and to me, that sounds wrong, that sounds not right, but yet why is Jesus using this analogy here? Not sure. Yes, Priscilla. It sounds like this uh, servant was really trying to benefit his problem and right. everything that you know he supposedly had done wrong, and he wasn't collecting the 
proper beds. So he was really thinking about himself in here. And yeah. what am I going to gain if I, if I just change my ways a little bit? I can gain benefits and then people will like me. But, but so he was really, I think he was self centered. Oh, yes. Yeah. And not, uh, you know, not doing really what the master right. uh, had expected of him when he had the job. So um, that probably can tell us too that we should not be, when we are think we're going to benefit others, don't think about what it's doing for us, but do do it because God instructs us to do it. The Holy Spirit instructs us to do it and do it joyfully and, and faithfully unto the Lord, not unto ourselves. Well, he was also stealing from his master. Because it learned a uh, uh, favorite to give what, what he wanted for us to give and giving it to another. It sure seems that way, doesn't it? Yeah, that he's that he's that he's pardoning something that his master never told him he could do, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he was already being accused of wasting his master's money. Right. And then he goes and wastes him a whole lot more. <laughs> I mean, it just seems contrary to. Yeah. It, this this is one of those things where you're kind of shaking your head. But let me ask you a question. Why do we have bankruptcy? And before you answer that question, do you know that there's two kinds of bankruptcy? There's one that's trying to settle everything and wiping everything clean. Another one is saying, here's how much I do have of money available, but I can't pay all of it because the amount that I, amount I have and the amount I owe are two different things. It's called bankruptcy chapter 7 I believe or is it 11 I can't remember I haven't declared bankruptcy and hope never to but it's, um, 11. it's 11 so 11 is where you say I have this much money and I'll pay whatever I can to everybody but they have to reduce or be willing to accept so if if, if can you if I owed you can um, $500 and I said, you know what, Ken, I can only pay you 400. Would you take my 400 or would you take zero? Which would you rather do? I'll take the 400. Yep, good choice. That's a wise choice. Um, that's, that's one of the things I think is interesting in our society that our government has set up a way to help people uh, who are over their heads, over their heads with debt but have some assets that they can try to repay some of what they have in a, in a fair legal way. And what's unique about this is what, does, what do we see further on in what is said in this uh, passage? It says, and if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will you trust with the true riches of heaven? And it goes back and says in verse 10, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. If you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. So here we're seeing that if you can't do the work that's necessary, God isn't going to bless you with more things, right? Um, people that don't have money giving them more money if they can't manage small amount of money isn't usually a wise choice, correct? But now getting back to the thing at hand here, I see is even though these things seem like stealing, seem dishonest, they actually work to the benefit of the owner. Because now this engages those people who own them Owe, owe money or owe things to the master. It engages them more. It, if I knew that I had a debt of a million dollars, I would feel overwhelmed because I don't know how I'd ever pay it. But if I had a debt of $10,000, that's more manageable in my brain that I could maybe somehow work out. So I'm trying to somehow work through this understanding here so that you can get some sense of what God is talking about. However, remember, we're talking about earthly things. And remember, the real reality is 
Earthly things are not the things that God sees as of value. What? Yeah, God doesn't care about our money. God doesn't care if you make $10,000 or $10 million. What he cares is our heart. The condition of the heart and the mind. Yeah. But we, as a society, everything is valued by what it's worth. Correct? Well, we put the value on money, and we shouldn't be doing that. That's Correct. the whole problem. But we value everything based on money. Right. Um, and the Lord don't want us to do that. Right. We should be valuing the persons and, and, and the people right. more than we value our money. Yeah. So it's you kind of like you say, it's better to give than receive. Yeah. So I, I'm going to just jump on a little soapbox here for a second. One of the toughest jobs to do is, is caring for people. And also, guess what? It's one of the worst paying jobs as well. Shouldn't that actually be the opposite from a God perspective? Because they're people, they're people of God. We should value people who work with other people more than the issue of things and all that. And yet, guess what? The people who operate things, meaning like financial people, get paid the most. And, but our world is upside down, not upside right. <laughs> I still love my manager of money and, and things like that that does stuff. I'm not saying they're evil people, but I'm saying we, we as a society have got it flipped around. Um, and I'm not here to try to resolve it all and have you guys sign petitions, but we just need to realize that. Okay, I've said some things so far. Do you have anything else to say on this? Verse 13 looks like it just doesn't even belong in this whole thing, at least in my opinion. Mm. No servant can serve two masters. I, I mean, what is he? I mean, I, that's a famous verse. I don't, you know, you hear it all the time, but in, in this context, it just doesn't seem like that's where it belongs. I don't know. Yeah. Kim, you got a thought here? I was just going to say something. Good. Go for it. Well, I think the focus here on on the part of the Pharisees and whatnot, who he's addressing, has always been on money and wealth. And I think a key in verse 9 there that you already mentioned, and make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness. It's interesting, he calls it the wealth of unrighteousness. So that when it fails, which it will, because any trust in confidence in mammon or, or will will fail. They will receive you into the eternal dwellings. You know, that last verse there kind of leaves it up in the air a little bit as to where that eternal dwelling is going to be. Because he's talking about how misguided they are in their focus on wealth and riches. Right. So it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting thought process that Jesus is throwing out there. And, uh, and of course, then he goes on into talking about being faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in much. And you'll also be trusted with much if you're faithful. Right. So we see a focus here dealing with the hard issue again of having the wrong perspective of money and mammon and what that can do for you, what the end results of it can be that Jesus is trying to speak to here. I think one other thing that try to answer your question, Judy, is we say, at least I do, I think, oh, I'm not that rich or I don't have that much, but in comparison to the rest of the world, I'm very wealthy. And I think all of us here in this circle don't really understand how influenced we are by money because we're always around money. Um, we understand how wonderful warm weather is because we've seen how cold weather can be, right? <laughs> and so we have an appreciation for both of those two things, both in the hot season, we're very thankful for the cold season. And when it's cold season, by the way, we're usually wanting the opposite of what wherever we are at. Isn't that interesting? 
Um, but I think that is a real challenge for us. We, we say, well, but I'm doing this or I'm giving this to God. Yes, we could always give more, I guess, but I, I'm just saying I think all of us have been so indoctrinated in our culture in what we have that always we're thinking, well, if I just get this other thing or if I do this, life will be better. And, and you know what I find in other third world countries? They're not asking those same questions. But they're happy. They follow Jesus Christ. And yet we keep thinking, well, if I go over to another country, I'll, I'll make them happy by bringing these things or helping them get this. And guess what? They don't need that to be happy. It might help them in their lives. Let's face it, all of us love vacuum cleaners because I'd rather not have to pick up all the lint off the carpet and things like that. But that's not what makes me happy, having a vacuum cleaner. So, I don't know, I'm trying to answer your question. I'm not sure if that works or not. Anybody else, or am I just talking to the wall here for a moment, so. One time when we were in Mexico, we went on a tour, and our guide said, no, when we look at these people, we think they're poor and miserable. But no, they're happy. Their kids have bicycles, they've got food, and they've got what they need, and even some things that they want. But when we look at it, it it just seems like they're so poor and desperate. Yeah. But he made the point of us, and this was not a Christian tour or anything, it was just a tour. And he really made a point that they were happy with what they had. And some of our people, when we were in Honduras, they would just shake their heads. And I said, no, 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 look at The house is clean, they've got dishes, they might not match, but they don't care. And they've got all these things. They've got clothes on their bodies. <coughs> they just have different values. And somebody's persuaded them to come up here. <laughs> yeah. Well, one, one thing that I've recently realized that I'm, we're going away from is uh, when, when Carol and I got married, you, what was one of the things we got? China. Because when we had guests come over, we would use those China. Well. We haven't had people over for a year plus, and guess what, even before that, we didn't use China very much. And now I've had it for 30 years and it looks bright, spanking new. It's time to start using it or get rid of it. And, and I think that's interesting, because today, if you go to weddings, you don't see people asking for China. That's moved on. We're not doing that anymore. My daughter doesn't even want it. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I, I went to a wedding uh, a couple years back where they went to uh, um, a second-hand store, and it was cheaper for them to buy china than it was to get disposable plates. <laughs> How do you like that? Well, I did uh, decide that it came time a few years ago they get rid of my everyday dishes. Yeah. And take my good dishes and put them in that place. And so that I was using good dishes, my good dishes all the time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't need that everyday ones. Yeah. Well, let's go on to the next part. So uh, if you haven't felt uncomfortable yet, now I'm really gonna make you feel uncomfortable. So let's look at verses 16, 17, and 18. Somebody wanna read that? The law and the prophets were. Am I reading the right one here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. You want me to go to 18? Okay. Yes, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay. So now we, in that last, uh, in 15, we saw, it says, what this world honors is detestable in God's sight. And then he goes on and brings up an example of that. And it talks about how 
the law of Moses, okay? Something that the pro, uh, prophets have told about and the Pharisees are supposed to follow and religious people are supposed to follow are the laws of Moses. And then he goes on and he says, but now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in. Boy, you know, remember that day when we heard that there was going to be a COVID shot and you could get that and that would protect you from COVID? Uh, boy, there was a rush of people. And just now it's starting to finally open up in terms of being more available because everybody's been wanting to get that. Um, and now we see this excitement that's going on and then it says but it says in 17 but that doesn't mean that the law has lost its force just because we have gotten our shots our covid shots does that mean that covid doesn't exist no no and if you have both of your shots or your one shot if you got the other the one can you still get covid sure you can yeah 10% up to. I just saw this week that 5,800 people have gotten COVID who had gotten all the shots two weeks past the date of when it was. Now, think about it. If you have millions of people and 5,800 people in the U.S. have gotten it, that's pretty small. <coughs> and think about how many more people would have gotten if they hadn't gotten their shots. So you have to look at it that way. Now, I'm using this as kind of a comparison here to, to get us to understand. So the law of Moses is still in play here. It's still communicated. However, there's a minimizing of something. And that's what's going on. It says, but that doesn't mean the law has lost its force. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than the smallest point of God's law to be overturned. Whoa. This is why Jesus Christ had to come to earth. Because his rules could not change, but God could use his son to bridge, a, bridge over those so that he could fulfill what we couldn't fulfill. Okay? And then he uses this example. For example, a man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery. And anyone who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, if we were to look at the Matthew text that says a similar thing to this, we would see there's an exception that you can get a divorce if the one of the partners has been unfaithful in that relationship. Okay. Um, today, we have people here in our midst who have been divorced. Uh, so how are we dealing with that? are we dealing with that? Because this sounds pretty harsh. First off, we do admit in the Old Testament it says God hates divorce. Correct? We all agree with that. But, also it says Moses allowed divorce, it says. Later on it says Moses allowed divorce because of your hard-heartedness. And, and so that was allowed and okay. But here, wow, it's pretty strong. A man who divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery. That's wrong. That's not right. How do we deal with this when two people who have been divorced and then they marry each other who had been divorced each else? How do we resolve this issue? Is if, what, if you're divorced, can you not get remarried? Is that the, the standard rule? Or how do we understand this? I think the passage you need to always look at is that no verse stands all by itself. Amen. Preach it. It has to be evaluated on the basis of other passages of Scripture dealing and related to the same issue. Yep. Uh, we can go to 1 Corinthians where it talks about chapter 7, talks about the husband and wife relationship and divorce, and that uh, if one of the members of the uh, the marriage decides to leave, let them go, and you're not bound. Yep. Okay, you're not bound anymore by that, that commitment that was there. So that's an exception as well to the sexual immorality. Yep. There's more scripture, I won't go into all of them, but there's more 
that come to bear on that same situation. And uh, I think it, it's like anything else, if, sin is, if it's a sin, it needs to be confessed. Yep. What happens when we confess our sin? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Not just some, yes. all. Yes. And uh, so we've got that, that whole issue of confessed sin that cleanses, cleanses you and removes that blemish from your soul. Just as if you'd killed somebody and asked forgiveness. God forgives it, he removes it as far as the east is from the west and he remembers it no more. Divorce, is, again, is, is another thing that falls into the same category of bracket. Yep. And so anybody that tries to take that in a different path has to contend with what Scripture says overall. Yeah. I totally agree with you, Kim. Yeah. I, I'm there. And I think for most of us, we're, we're in agreement with what Kim's saying. However, we just need to be careful that we don't equate divorce as a speeding ticket. You know what I mean by that? Right. That it's just, ah, yeah, whatever. You know, I was going faster than I should have, but everybody else does. It's fine. No, it's a serious issue. When we get divorced, we need to make it a serious issue. But is there forgiveness? Is there grace? And the answer is yes. Yeah. Right. And if we can't say that, that there is not forgiveness and grace, then what does that say about us? Because I should be here if that's the case. Because I am a sinner that's saved by grace. Um, and I think this is very careful. We have to be real careful because people will see this scripture and say, well, there's no chance for somebody else. I would also point out that people who do get divorced and then remarry have a higher chance of getting divorced a second time as well. Um, and here is my point. Because my guess is they haven't resolved the issues of their past that led maybe to their first reason for getting divorced. And the same is true with all of us. If we don't resolve the issues of, uh, that are tripping us up, whether it's I'm eating too much, meaning I shouldn't cook so much food or putting so much on my plate, if I don't <laughs> constrain that, then I'm always going to stay what I am, right? I mean, that's just the reality of the things. We have to change if we're wanting to see a change in what we're doing. Thoughts on this? Anybody else want to say anything else? It's all the condition of the heart. Yeah. The heart and the mind. If we don't have the heart and the mind of God, then we can't live with it or be an example to others. I think what needs to be understood here too is that if it's not dealt with properly, it is going to become a stumbling block in your life yeah. for God's blessing. Because you haven't got His forgiveness, you can't have His blessing without that. So yeah. it's important to confess that sin if there's any other sin. And once it's confessed, it's forgiven. Amen. But there is a responsibility we have to deal with that in the right way in order to be set free. Yeah. And remember, what people value here on earth is not the same thing God values. God values the heart aspect. That's the most important part of this. Yeah. Uh, unless there's something else on that, I would like to read uh, the next part. Uh, would somebody please read uh, 19 to the end of the chapter? Verse 19 through the end of the chapter. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. 
but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus in to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let them warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Wow. Well, here's another story that we've got some unpacking to do. Um, the, um, the, I don't know about you, but while I was reading that, it reminded me again of a, of a story called Scrooge, the Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. Did anybody else have that kind of in your head? At least one or two of you nodding or kind of shaking your head, maybe saying, what in the world? But... Um, interesting story and remember again this is a story it's a parable it's meant to say a specific thing and I want to go right to what I think the specific thing is verse 26 and besides there is a great chasm separating us it says no one can cross over to you from there and no one can cross over to us from there there is a separation that is going to happen for all of us, whether we want to accept and believe in Jesus Christ or not. And when we make that choice and when we die, there will be a separation between those who are going to be in heaven and those who are going to be in hell. That is what is trying to be pointed out here. That is the key thing. And remember, again, isn't Jesus all about wanting us to hear reasons to make a decision to choose the right way of doing it. Just like it was back in Luke chapter 15, it talks about what God is willing to do, his, his willingness, his lavishness of welcoming back even after we spend all the money. He doesn't care about the money, he cares about us. And we've been hearing that so far, and now we see this rich man and this poor man. Interesting. Um, well, let's go back and, and look at a few things here in, in what's going on. So we see the rich man has purple clothes. Uh, remember, purple <laughs> is a sign of wealth. Some of us like purple, and so we wear it. Does that mean we're rich and wealthy? Uh, well, I, I'll leave that to you. But in our culture today, oftentimes different logos on our shirts say something. and We hope that says something about us. I don't know, whenever I'm wearing a logo that has a certain big box store on it, I'm not usually excited about advertising <laughs> that one. Uh, but anyway, what do you think about this and what it's saying about Lazarus and this rich man? What do you, what's your thoughts about that? <clears throat> This verse that I was questioning back in verse 13 yes. fits in better over here. Okay. <laughs> because the rich man was serving himself yep. instead of it serving God. Yeah. Well, Lazarus had the spirit that God wanted. The rich man did not. What is the problem with Lazarus? Is the problem that he has wealth? No, it's not the problem he has wealth. It's the problem is he didn't how he used the wealth. Exactly. And, um, <clears throat> so that God doesn't care how much money you have. Yeah. It's how you use your money and how, how it's served, and that's the point he's trying to make. That <clears throat> he was in a position to help this person, and he didn't help him. And now when he went to heaven, the opposite just happened. Yeah. And by the way, he says, the, the rich man says, hey, go to see my brothers and tell them what's going on. But it's interesting, before that, he first is focused on himself. 
Um, it's cool, my tongue. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, my children, when they were little, I remember when it's like they were so tired after playing outside. Dad, just give me a drink of water. I can't even get a glass out myself and pour it. You know, they were so weak and feeble. You know, and I and I wanted what I should have said is, why don't you first go serve your your brother or sister and then come back and get yourself a glass? <laughs> what do you think of that? I never, I wasn't smart enough to say that. Uh, but I, that also is something to be said about us when we're thirsty. And, and do we think, hey, if I'm thirsty, maybe my spouse or my friend is also thirsty. Maybe I should offer them something. Is it only when we're hosting a party that we pay attention to other people? I, I have a problem sometimes. I focus on my own plate and enjoy my food so much I forget about everybody else's plate and realizing some of them maybe have, would like the food passed again to them. Cause we don't, we're, we're Scandinavian, so we don't ask about passing, right? We, we just kind of wait till we hope the, pa the host will pass the food to us. It reminds me of a story uh, for myself when my first time being out of the country, uh, I was in a culture in Eastern Europe, and I was with a bunch of people who weren't Scandinavian, and, and so that was a new thing for me. And they asked, uh, we're passing the plate around after having some of the food and trying a second time and I said no I'm okay and then they didn't ask again and if you're in Scandinavian culture you know you ask two to three times <laughs> and I was offended because I said no the first time and they never asked again and no wonder why I lost weight while I was there because uh, I'm used to a culture where you deny three times and then you accept the fourth right you, you, you're modest <laughs> sorry that's a little off the, the track here but he clearly is focused on himself he is not interested in his other people. And what's really interesting to me is he thinks that now that he can't connect to um, his family, he says, you can send a representative and they'll tell the story. They'll make a difference. And what is God's response to that? We see in verse 30 and 31. The rich man replied, no, Abraham, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. And Abraham's response is, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. By the way, who did rise from the dead? Jesus. Jesus. And if they aren't willing to listen to what Jesus did, they're not willing to listen to anyone. I don't know about you, but that just takes my breath away. I think the main point on the the ending of this that once you die, you're done. You're dead. You don't get a second chance to accept the Lord. Yeah, yeah I I would agree with you. This would uh, definitely negate a certain thought that you know we can go to uh, a bad place and burn off our sins and then get. No, no. You had your opportunity. You had your chance when you were here. Right. Don't pass it up. Yes. Any other thoughts? You know, it's interesting that uh, hell, Hades, is a holding place here where uh, the rich man ended up. He's not in a place removed from recognizing that there is benefit where Abraham was and suffering going on where he was for that time period of waiting until a final judgment. Yeah. It's got to have a, a terrible effect on the lost, sitting in hell, thirsting, and getting to think about that until the end time comes where they're judged finally, cast into the lake of fire. And there isn't anything they can do to change it. Right. Well, that's hell. Yeah. And and it puts a new slant on thinking about that. 
Because yeah. hell, hell gives up the dead that are in it at the end of the thousand year millennium. Right. A great white throne judgment. So that's a long haul for people that have been sent there to wait. And, and what's interesting is he's not begging to get out of that place of torment, is he? All he's asking is to be pacified. And look for my family. Yeah. So he still is rejecting what God really has. And I think that's very interesting. That I, I do believe that one reason why God doesn't say, okay, now you can come into heaven after being some other place is because I don't think they'll ever accept God. They will continually reject. And it, it, it just seems unfathomable for us who know Jesus Christ, who is willing and able to forgive all of our sins, but we need to confess our sins to him, and he, is, he will forgive us. But they don't want to. They're rejecting God. So they're putting themselves in that place. To me, this is a lesson, well, maybe it's just for me, but uh, it's a lesson of faith. Yeah. I mean, you have to believe God. You have to have faith uh, in Him. Mm -hmm. And you can't be argued into the kingdom. Yep. You have to have faith. And to me, this is the most, well, that's to me, but to me, that's the most important message of this thing is you have to operate your life through faith. And of course, he mentions, uh, you know, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, well, if they don't believe, you know, the word, and believe in Jesus Christ through faith, none of us can talk anybody into heaven. Right. You've got to have faith. That's the basic dominant feature, it seems to me, yeah. uh, of, of this passage. But maybe that's just for me. But. No, I think we all would agree. Faith is, is the key to this. Um, anything else anybody want to share? Well, I would go back to verse 16 and say that's kind of central to a lot of this, and it's, you know, it's, it's a contrast between the law and the prophets that were proclaimed until John and the good news of the kingdom, which is one of grace and mercy yes. that we receive. We, we saw previously that the father extended mercy to his son when, and, and grace when his son returned and repented. Then we find that even without that relationship, the, uh, the, the, the rich man and his manager, uh, the, they're both extending a, a form of grace. There's a lot of people in the world that, since they don't expect people to be perfect, yeah. they know they're not. There's a lot of people outside of the church that extend, extend probably more grace and more mercy to the people around them than, than, than the people who are in the light. Yeah. Um, and so we come to this point and, and we're told that, that the law and the prophets you know, is kind of done away with at this point. We're told that, that, that the story is about God's kingdom yes. and, and the good news of that. Um, and I, you know, I, I can't help but wonder if perhaps some of the statements in here are better expressed as questions. Um, you know, for example, in verse 16, you, know, you might ask, is it easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out? Well, anyone who's tried to hand copy anything of any length knows how easy it is to make mistakes. Yes. Um, clearly, it's, 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 it's easier to, to do that, to lose those small strokes in writing, copying something, unless you pay exceeding detail just to the, the, the action of doing it. We have the, the, the issue of adultery. And for, you know, particularly for, for, for the Jewish people, I would imagine that there's one great example of adultery in the Old Testament, that of David. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, 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 and so there's a, there's a piece there where 
again, God extended incredible grace to David through that whole process. And now we come to, to, to Lazarus and so forth. And, and even there, if we come to, to the uh, verse 31, if that's being said by, by Abraham in response that they didn't listen to the law and, and, and the prophets, so, so could they be convinced if someone came back from the dead? We know the truth is that, yes, the, uh, the, the, the resurrection has, has great impact, far greater impact, wider, deeper impact than the law ever had. Right. And so, so to me, I, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking that this is by and large a contrast between, between the law and the prophets and the, the grace of the kingdom of God. And, and, and within that, you know, it just looks a lot different as we're looking at these accounts at these stories. So let me see if you agree with this. Judgment is God's and justice is God's. Mm -hmm. And it's he, God, that deals with all of that. It's not mm -hmm. us, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's him. And, and so when we think we have some part to play in, in it, it, the reality is it's God that has all the parts to play. Is that a fair, that's how I mm -hmm. can agree with you and also hear what everybody else is saying and fit it together. But I, I, I'm with you, but I'm also with what we've also said. Does that make sense, Jim? Yeah. I, 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 that's great. I, any other thoughts along that line? Well, just that saying uh, that, you know, well, I don't go to church because, you know, it's full of hypocrites. Yeah. And my response is, hey, there, there's room for one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it does make us realize that uh, we are totally and utterly dependent on God. And that it is God that provides. It's God that will show mercy. And he's the one that's going to show justice. And, it, and as long as we continue in the right following what he's calling us to, then we have nothing to worry. We have no fear. Um, but also, when we realize that we do have things like wealth and other ways to establish uh, stuff, are we doing it to serve ourselves or are we doing it to give to other people? So, um, since I, I recently got a new grill, it just tells me I need to have big, you guys over at times to share the wealth, right? No, not shrimp. Yeah. Not shrimp. <laughs> no shrimp. No shrimp. All right. Yeah, we'll have lutefisk instead. So I'll, I'll cook it on a board. I'll cook it on a board. Wait, so. you can go back to the shrimp. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray. I thank you, God, for these words. And Lord, we know that we don't fully understand all that you have, but God, we do believe that you do want to tell us things through this. And I thank you that as we reason with one another that uh, the words that we hear, that we would, our faith would be sharpened by each other, and that God, we would be stronger and more united in our understanding of what you are trying to tell us. And I thank you, God, for... Um, viewpoints and thoughts and I thank you Lord for the truth that your words are may we dig deep and may you help us to grow in our understanding of who you are and may our minds understand more but also may our hearts expand more as well as we live out our lives to glorify you and thank you for this time together in Jesus name amen amen well, uh, just so you know, next week I'm changing up our walk times. We've been doing it on Tuesdays, and uh, well, when I say we, uh, we haven't had many people on Tuesdays. So uh, we're going to go to Thursday, and if Thursday works for you, next, month, next Thursday at 1 p.m., if it's not raining, not snowing, uh, love to have you. We just walk a few blocks around and uh, just enjoy it. Uh, we had the opportunity to walk by uh, Marge Davison's house and give her a call in the process of walking. She wasn't home at the time, but 
we left a message and waved at her. So we might do some of that with some other people around the neighborhood as well. So love to have you come and just go for a little walk with me at 1 p.m. on Thursday. Um, I think that's all. We'll have communion this Sunday. And if you aren't going to be able to be here but are going to watch it virtually, which is fine, um, make sure you take a communion cup with you to celebrate communion this week if you'd like. So, okay. Thank you all. Have a good day in the Lord.